Hello, guys. Just a few minutes. Um, I'm willing to wait a, a few minutes because I have 180 80, uh, registered person, but I only see less than 80. So let's give uh, people just a couple of minutes to, to connect, right? So I, I'm already here. I'm just setting things uh, up. So uh, don't worry, we will start in, in a few minutes. Okay, guys. Uh, so, uh, request to to speak. No, uh, Regina, my dear friend. No, I will not allow you to speak today. Uh, so, um, but in case you need uh, some something, um, this is something that I normally uh, uh, tell to my to my students. Uh, this platform is the one that I use for uh, online training and and webinars and and so on. 
Um, so um, it, it has uh, plenty of features. Um, just let me go through the interesting one, the ones that we are going to use today. Uh, of course, there is a, the possibility for you to uh, ask for, uh, for um, let's say, uh, interaction. Uh, you can raise your hands. But in this case, as we are quite a few persons, I will not allow you uh, until the uh, question and answer uh, session at the end of this, uh, of this uh, first uh, session. Um, it, this is just uh, in order to don't have um, many, um, let's say, interruptions. Um, I want to keep uh, the, the workflow, uh, let's say, running smooth. So uh, please save your questions for, for a, the questions and, and, and answer, OK? Um, also, there is another thing. Um, uh, hi, Manuela. Uh, there is another thing. Um, uh, this uh, this uh, platform doesn't give any um, uh, sound, doesn't emit any sound. So uh, when, when you speak uh, or when you write something down in the, in the chat uh, view, uh, I will not be aware of this because I will be uh, in my Rhino Grasshopper uh, interface. So um, uh, I, I will not be hearing you. So from time to time, I will switch to the platform view, uh, window. So I, I can uh, have a look at uh, what's happening. Um, Yaroslav, it does not work. Uh, uh, I don't know uh, what you mean. I see that everybody is uh, receiving the transmission and and uh, and everybody's hearing me. So I suppose that there is no problem on my side. Um, so yeah, first of all, uh, this this session, this webinar uh, is uh, um, is part of a series of uh, things that I am doing. Um, due to this uh, quarantine, forced quarantine that we are all living worldwide due to the coronavirus that uh, has spread all over the world. Um, as you might know already, this is not a one session webinar. This webinar consists in two, two sessions. This is the first one. It will last two hours, more or less. And the second session will, be, will take place next Saturday at the same time. Uh, so um, when you register to this webinar, you are, you already signed uh, in for the uh, both sessions. So there is no need for you to uh, sign up once again. Uh, so you're already registered for the two sessions. Um, there are other things that I have that I've been doing uh, recently uh, for this uh, uh, coronavirus situation. So I will just quickly uh, share my uh, my screen. Let me. Uh, stop the slide presentation. I will share my screen with you, so you will see eventually my uh, uh, my my desktop now. And um, uh, yeah, basically there are a couple of things that that, that are that are basically uh, contained in this uh, um, five by one grasshopper COVID uh, nineteen. Uh, this is a post that I wrote uh, where I explained the the intention behind my initiatives and. Uh, the first one was this uh, uh, special bundle with five grasshopper courses for just one, basically. Um, as you can see, it doesn't include uh, kangaroo. Uh, it was left out because of, of a technical reason. I don't have any um, kangaroo video course in English uh, actually published on my website. Uh, so these are the only um, uh, video courses uh, available in English for now. But as you may, as as you can imagine, I will have plenty of time to to record new sessions and new a new uh, uh, video courses. So expect to uh, have some updates um, uh, quickly. Also, there is something that is not published here, um, and I want to share it with you uh, right now. I have uh, this uh, uh, grasshopper script. Um, I will share it with you um, in uh, in a few minutes. Uh, it basically creates the. Uh, coronavirus model. I think it's interesting not because of the um, result of the shape uh, of the virus. Uh, it's interesting because there is a whole approach uh, with uh, a few, a bunch uh, of plugins like Cocoon or Heteroptera, which, by the way, I think is one of the greatest plugins that that you can have in in Grasshopper. And also, this allows me to introduce the false start toggle, which is something with, uh, very important when you work with, uh, especially with Kangaroo. Uh, but also with Cocoon, for example. Um, this is a, a very simple plugin, actually. Uh, I will share with you this link with you now in the, 
in the chat window so you will you you can download it from my uh, mega um, uh, hard drive uh, let me go into the uh, chat and i will share it here so this link basically leads you to uh, the download of the false uh, start toggle um irene uh, yes the the webinar is is being recorded right now um, I don't know if I'm going to publish it soon because I think I, I will um, edit it or, or apply some, some corrections or something. Um, this is because to, especially because of some um, noises that, might, that you might uh, hear from time to time. Uh, actually, this is the, um, the, um, the, 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 the cons of working uh, at home. Uh, especially in a, in a place like like um, Coyoacan in Mexico City, which is quite uh, noisy. Okay, um, but yes, it's it's being recorded right now. Um, so here uh, you have this initiative. Uh, there is the the um, virus model that I'm going to share with you. I repeat, it's not because of the virus shape. It's because this there is a, a an approach to these uh, these uh, plugins, which is. Uh, very interesting. Uh, so basically, just to give you an idea of, of what this thing uh, is doing, uh, I will just, uh, let's say, uh, visualize uh, something. As you can see, I'm not I'm not um, showing the, the final result because it needs some calculation performed by Cocoon. Uh, but basically, when you are when you have this definition running, you can hit F5 and you have several coronaviruses uh, coming out. OK, so it's just for fun, but it's a way for or uh, learning something in uh, in grass software. So this is going to be shared with you. Um, I'm going to uh, share it right now in your in your um, uh, session. You see that there is these files, and I'm going to uh, take add a new file. I will call it like Corona Virus and upload a file and go here and just upload this Corona. And so you have it here available in your in your uh, files uh, window. Okay. Um, as I told you, Francesca, I'm not going to allow, um, um, uh, let's say, uh, you speaking uh, in order to keep things uh, smooth. Um, oh, uh, Cesar, I don't know about this, but you you could. Uh, look on, uh, on on the web you can search for the false start toggle on the web and and see if it works uh, i have it running so i do recommend it because it's uh, it's very important to control whether the uh, the calculation uh, are, are running in grass software especially when you perform some complex operations uh, so let's go back to our um, slides here and um, and, and let me introduce you. Uh, of, well, some of you might know me already, uh, also in the real life. I, I saw some friends, as I told you. Um, so um, I am Giancarlo, I'm an Italian uh, designer um, with a background in, uh, in uh, building engineering. Um, um, but actually I work, I almost uh, always work as a, a university professor. Um, I, I, I give uh, classes at the private university in Mexico City. Um, I teach in industrial design and digital media and, and, and interaction as uh, undergraduate courses. And then I also um, uh, give courses in, in postgraduate, um, like um, contemporary jewelry or, or um, material transformations and so on. Okay. Um, but I also give conferences and lectures. Uh, so you can see here are some, some lectures I've been giving recently in the last years. Um, and the last one from from uh, parametric to tectonic to to beam uh, was in China uh, in uh, in um, in Shanghai uh, last year uh, in RFR. Um, uh, these are some things that uh, that my students uh, created the, during their their um, basically parametric design courses in industrial design or, or uh, in digital media or in uh, postgraduate courses. Uh, so um, this is a work which is interesting because it was uh, created in Kangaroo, actually. Uh, this is something that um, has nothing to do with textile, of course. This is the dome of the Sport Palace of, of, of Mexico City. 
Um, but it's very interesting because um, it introduces the, the um, tensegrity modeling. Uh, so, uh, by the way, uh, you could take a look at the offers section in this interface um, where you will find two offers. And these offers uh, uh, allows you to get a 10% discount on, on any video course available on my, on my website, but also on a special edition of the Kangaroo Online course. I will be repeating this um, a bunch of time during this webinar uh, because I have created a special uh, Kangaroo Online course to integrate this, uh, this textile simulation module that we are uh, assisting uh, with this webinar. So textile simulation is a part of my standard Kangaroo uh, course. Um, the rest is basically uh, rigid body simulation and tensegrity simulation, origami simulation, and so on. So if you want, there is this special offer that is not available on my website. So if you click here, uh, if you click on the offer, I am, I am uh, starting the offer right now. So if you click on this offer, offer you will see that um, there is a, a, um, um, a special product which is not available uh, to standard uh, uh, visitors on my website. Okay, so keep in mind that this offer is, uh, is basically limited to the extension of this webinar. So you have uh, up to the next session to uh, jump in and, uh, and buy this course, we which will take place in, in specific dates. So it will not be available forever, okay? Um, let me just get a quick look at the chat window. Um, yeah, uh, so Gianni, uh, this, this uh, uh, coronavirus uh, definition needs a few plugins. So you must have them available. There is a text um, in, uh, on the top of the definition which says which plugins uh, you must have uh, installed, okay? Okay, so um, let's go back to our uh, presentations. Um, and of course, some might know me for the, the book that I published um, actually a couple of years ago, uh, but it, were, it was already, uh, let's say, suitable for, for working with Rhino 6, so it's perfectly uh, actual. Um, this book is not on Grasshopper. Uh, this book is uh, for advanced NURBS uh, modeling with Rhino. Uh, but NURBS uh, modeling and NURBS geometry and in topolo NURBS topology are, are very important, even if you are working, well, especially if you work with Grasshopper, actually. So everything you, you do with Grasshopper is based on, on Rhino. So having a good knowledge of, uh, of NURBS topology is fundamental if you want to achieve good results in also in Grasshopper. And this book is available on, on Amazon, so you can uh, look for it on Amazon and you will easily get your, your copy. So let's uh, jump into textile simulation um, things. So, well, basically textile simulation is something that has kept me uh, occupied during the last years. I have also uh, ongoing collaboration with some companies uh, around the world with uh, these textile simulation um stuff so uh, basically what you see here what you saw uh, in the uh, main image uh, of this webinar is what uh you it, it might seem like a a good um let's say approximation of a textile um uh, shape okay uh, but actually it, it is not that accurate so uh, i'm going to show you just some concepts some some general concepts uh, which are important uh, for uh, both textile simulation and also for, um, let's say, for, for, for textile in general and for textile simulation in Grasshopper. So you see this is basically uh, the graphical representation of one of the fundamental uh, equations for, from physics, which is the Hooke's uh, law, uh, which is basically the equation for the elastic force, okay? Um, I, I'm not going to go, uh, to, to go too deep uh, in this, but as you can see, Elastic phase has two different, um, um, let's say, behaviors, okay? The first one, which is this uh, linear uh, part of the graphic, is basically corresponds to the elastic phase, okay? Then there is this part here that I will just globally describe as the plastic phase. Uh, so um, when you have uh, some elastic behavior, uh, everything keeps being elastic up to a certain point, and then there is some um, deformation occurring, which is not, uh, let's say, going to be reabsorbed by the system. 
So when you go into plastic deformation, the system is not capable of going back to the, to the original um, uh, shape or, or configuration, okay? Now, we are going to work with Kangaroo, um, and Kangaroo, especially Kangaroo, um, the last version, which is Kangaroo 2, which is the one included in, in Grasshopper, actually, Grasshopper for, for Rhino 6, um, has, has introduced some kind of simplification, okay, with respect to Kangaroo 099. So I, I prefer normally to, uh, still, I prefer to work with uh, Kangaroo 099 sometimes, because it's more natural to define also plastic behavior. It's, it's easier and it's more immediate. Uh, but we are going to, to do some basic simulation using Kangaroo 2, so we will stick to the elastic phase uh, of the um, stress-strain relationship, okay? Uh, so just to uh, make this clear, we will not be talking about plastic deformation. Okay, and the other thing is uh, this image that um, uh, basically, uh, well, um, what's interesting in this image is the first and the last picture. Okay, so focus on these two things here. Uh, so when you have some kind of fabric or textile in, in, in your hand, you might notice that, that basically threads are, are knitted in a particular way. Okay, so we are going to discuss just two types of uh, of uh, uh, knitting or, or threading which is which are this one and this one okay uh, which are the simplest one by the way um so um i will be showing you as the first thing in the um in the grasshopper file that i already uh, opened okay um and you will be able to create something like uh, some some objects like this well um uh, uh, this the, the the material that you see here is just rendering. Okay, of course this is not the the uh, grasshopper model. It, it would be crazy to do something like this uh, in in grasshopper and kangaroo. Okay, as well as as this one. Uh, this is uh, some some textile, uh, but uh, this this aspect here is just rendering, of course. Okay, so no textures, no materials. We are not going to discuss uh, these things. But also, uh, even if there is uh, a whole um set of information that you should know uh, uh, at the time uh, of applying materials to uh, this kind of extremely deformed object okay but we will not be discussing this um so let's go to grasshopper and uh, and see uh, what happens i'm going i'm going to stop the slide presentation right now oh let me see if there is uh, some question john i think we can see your your mouse uh, well, it's, it's not relevant. Um, it, there was just a, a uh, let's say, a, a presentation going on. Um, uh, okay, okay, Michael, don't don't worry. I think uh, the important thing is now. I'm going to share my my desktop once once again, and we are going to jump into Rhino. And please let me know if you see my mouse right now. So I'm going to switch to the chat once again. Uh, I, I don't know if you could see the mouse in uh, in Rhino. Can you give me a feedback? Um, yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So if you have questions about plugins and and so on, um, we can discuss these. Or, or, or also, you can send me a message. There is absolutely no problem. I don't know if you have my my social network um, links, but I will show you uh, right now. Uh, basically, you can find me here on, on Facebook, especially. So I'm Janka uh, DM uh, almost uh, in, uh, in all my social networks. So um, also in Instagram and Twitter. So you can find me like Janka DM. Okay. So just uh, add me on in, in, in social network and uh, we, will, we will keep in touch and I will answer uh, to all of your questions. Uh, I prefer to to keep the questions and and the Q and A uh, session for uh, questions which are relevant uh, from the textile simulation point of view. Okay, um, so yeah, you can see that I uh, put the same image here. Um, <clears throat> this is the the site that you if you want to read the paper from these guys here. It's from 2017, but the, the physical model is uh, <clears throat> basically uh, the same. Okay. Um, there are also more detailed, um, uh, let's say, more detailed, um, let's say, geometrical representation of a textile, but this is more than enough for us uh, at the moment. So let's say that we want to create uh, some some um, um, surface and to um, let's say convert this into some kind of fabric um, 
or, or textile, okay? So I'm going to take just a simple plain surface. Um, <clears throat> and um, this is the uh, square surface that I'm going to convert into a textile. And the easiest thing that we can do um, before going into meshes and so on, the easiest thing that you can do is basically uh, use lunchbox, okay? So I'm sure everybody here knows lunchbox. Um, well, some, sometimes it would not be so easy for me to, um, let's say, find the plugin. Uh, as you can see, I have a, a whole bunch of plugins here in my Grasshopper uh, setup. Uh, so you will see that I will be looking for the right, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, interface, the right toolbar. Uh, but in this case, I was lucky. Uh, so you see that we have here this and this. Okay. So. Uh, these two components, these two functions from, from Lunchbox allow to create exactly uh, the, um, the textile model that we see in these images, okay? So the first one, you see that it has two diagonals here, and the second one, only one, okay? Uh, the direction is also relevant, as we will discuss in a, in a, in a few moments, okay? But let's, let's see what happens when we use this, okay? So if I plug the plane into this first grid 1D structure, you see that I already have uh, these, um, uh, let's say, set of lines coming out. So you see that there are primary lines, primary lines which are basically the uh, edges of each of these squares here, and the brace lines, which are the diagonals. So if I take a line component and I turn off this, you will see that these are the squares, the little square, which the amount depends on the U divisions and V divisions, of course, uh, and the brace lines are the diagonals, okay? So you see that with one function, we already have uh, the um, a whole um, a model ready for this kind of uh, um, textile simulation, okay? And with the second one, I'm going to turn this off, this off. with the second one, we have this. Now, this um, deserves a, a, a quick, uh, let's say, uh, uh, discussion here because we have primary lines and brace lines as well, but you will notice that uh, primary lines are basically the same. So you see that there are um, 220. And if we take a, a look at what happens, we always see the, the squares, okay? But if we plug the brace lines, we have these, okay? Now, our model must consist into one single line between two opposite vertices, okay? So let's take a look at what happens here. Because uh, if I take this, and I take, for example, let's say a list item, and I uh, turn on the uh, edges, you see that I'm only seeing half diagonal line, okay? So this cannot be uh, like this, basically. So what I can do is, and, and I had to test this because this is not so automatic. I mean, when you have a square with uh, lines coming out from the center like this, this is what's happening here. And if you uh, tell Grasshopper, please join me these lines, there is no guarantee that Grasshopper will join this one and this one. It could also join this one and this one. So you will have a couple of weird diagonals or weird lines inside each of these uh, fabric uh, panels, okay? So I, I double check this. If, uh, if you join the, the curves, okay? And I do a list item right now. Uh, you see that we have this thing here, okay? So basically it is joining in, in the right direction. So half diagonal with half diagonal, okay? But as all these diagonals are aligned, it is also joining all the diagonal of, of the whole panel, okay? Of the whole surface. So I don't want this, okay? So you see that basically we should split the diagonals by panel, okay? Or else we will get a whole set of long lines flowing all over the textile surface. And we don't want this, okay? We need diagonals inside each of these little squares, okay? So how can we do this? Before joining things, we must take all these lines here and see how they are ordered inside this data structure. So this also allows me to introduce the Data Trees uh, webinar, which is uh, happening tomorrow. Uh, because as you can see, whatever you, you might want to do in Grasshopper, data manipulation is, is uh, uh, fundamental, okay? So you cannot live without data manipulation. I'm going to take just 0 to 100 in order to isolate the first 
uh, diagonals and see uh, how they are ordered or sorted inside our uh, list. So you can see that we have the first four, and then we switch panel, and then we switch panel, each four uh, we switch panel, okay? So what I want to do is basically take this list of uh, small lines, partition this list using a size of four, and so here we will have four lines um, for each panel, okay? So if I join them, I am joining inside each panel. And you see that now we have two polylines per panel, okay? Now, the only thing we must double check which are these, uh, uh, <clears throat> these polylines that we are getting. So if I take a curved container right now, you see that now we have these... Uh, um, uh, diagonals here and on the other uh, end we have the opposite diagonals okay uh, so just to to double check once again if uh, we have just one line inside each panel uh, what we can do here we have this uh, uh, tree I'm going to flatten and I'm going to take a list item just to check what happens with the first line you see that this is correct and if I take a 0 to 100 and do this, you see that we only have one diagonal, okay? So here we finally have the uh, the right lines that we are looking for, okay? So we have these, and we also have these lines, okay? So you must uh, just play around with, uh, with uh, the result of the um, uh, brace grid to the structure from Lunchbox in order to have the proper set of lines uh, that will work exactly like in this model, okay? Um, so if any one of you already has knowledge of, of Kangaroo, uh, well, basically you already have everything because you have these lines here and then you have the diagonals. And you can convert this into springs as we will be discussing in a while and have your, your um, let's say, elastic model for your textile, okay? But we will uh, discuss this in, uh, in a while. Um, so I'm going to... Uh, group and turn off this thing and I'm going to switch to the kangaroo simulation okay so uh, you will notice that my grasshopper interface shows two k's here and these are the two kangaroos that I was saying that I was saying so this is the the, the old one the kangaroo 099 and this is the new one uh, probably the one that you uh, will be using uh, uh, in your daily uh, practice okay uh, but I want to just show you uh, what I meant when I was saying that I prefer to work with uh, with the old kangaroo. Um, when you go to, to the old kangaroo interface, you have all the forces grouped in this uh, unique uh, panel here. And I'm just going to grab one, which is the fundamental, which is springs from line. Okay. So um, if you take a look at the way that the old kangaroo creates springs, if compared to the new kangaroo, which only use the length line, you see that there is a, lot, a, a whole bunch of parameters that the new kangaroo is not considering by default, okay? Of course, you can find a way to implement strategies to include this kind of, of behaviors, but uh, you have everything concentered, uh, uh, let's say everything gathered inside one function in your kangaroo, okay? So for example, uh, connection and stiffness uh, basically are the two parameters that, we, that you have here, okay? Um, and rest length, of course, okay? But then there is damping and upper cutoff and lower cutoff and plasticity, okay? So with one component, you see that you can also define, for example, how many bouncing, how much uh, bouncy the model will be, the elastic behavior will be with damping, for, for example. Or if you want the elastic force to uh, stop working um, when... Uh, when uh, um, the system, uh, let's say, receive a, an excessive uh, deformation or a, an irrelevant deformation like upper cutoff or lower cutoff. And then you also can simulate the plastic behavior of, of the spring. So deformation that will not be recovered by the system, okay? So everything uh, is gathered inside one single component in the old kangaroo, while in the new one, you have this, which only creates the springs. So it only creates the elastic uh, behavior, okay? And then you have other things that you can do here. For example, you have plastic length and so on, okay? But but you have to set up a whole set of functions in order to have a proper simulation for your textile or your elastic um, uh, body, okay? 
Um, we will be working with Kangaroo too because it's easier, it's quicker, and we are not going to take care about the plastic deformation of our fabric. Okay, but just keep in mind that if you want to go deeper in, in this uh, in this subject, you must also take a look at, at the old kangaroo and uh, take a look at the plastic behavior of uh, of your of your uh, model. Okay, so just keep in mind that kangaroo by itself is um, a simulator for elastoplastic system. Okay, so it's it's important to have also the plastic component uh, taken into account. Uh, so let's go back to to our. Um, Let's go back to our uh, um, simulation here. I'm going to uh, create a simulation in order to introduce the, the textile behavior, um, which is something that I already published, by the way, on my YouTube channel. It's, uh, it's basically a, a uh, tutorial, but if I'm not wrong, it's in Spanish, okay? So uh, people here we, we, that, that don't know Spanish, uh, they can take advantage of this. It would be a quick, uh, um, tour of all the characteristics that you must take, must take into account when simulating a, a fabric or a textile, okay? Um, so, for example, I'm going to take uh, the usual uh, plane surface, and uh, as we are going to deal with, um, uh, with kangaroo, uh, kangaroo works with meshes, uh, so what I'm going to do, um, I, I'm not going to use the um, the lunchbox uh, technique or method right now in order to have our um, textile up and running. Uh, eventually, I will use it just for a particular particular considerations, but I'm going to use the simplified um, uh, model, which is, by the way, the image that you saw on the webinar announcement, okay? Um, so for the moment, I'm not going to take into account the diagonals. I'm, go I'm, I'm just going to take into account the squares, okay? So the edges of the uh, mesh definitions. So first of all, I'm going to take this plane and convert it into a mesh. So like here, I do recommend that you uh, uh, turn off the preview of the previous component if you don't want to get these uh, uh, rendering issues, okay? So here I have the mesh surface. Oh, by the way, if you don't see the mesh edges, the internal mesh edges, you just control M in Grasshopper and you have these uh, um, edges appearing. Okay, and how many subdivisions uh, we will give to this uh, um, mesh plane? Well, it depends on how much detail you want during the simulation. Um, and also it depends on the uh, computing power that, that, uh, that you have uh, in your machine, okay? So normally I never exceed the uh, 20 by 20 uh, amount of uh, UNB division. So I will take here a slider between, let's say, 1 to 20, okay? And I will eventually copy it if we want an asymmetrical uh, behavior for our for our fabric. And so you see that we can, uh, uh, let's say, create a 20 by 20, so 400 polygons uh, resolution for this mesh uh, object, okay? Which is already quite good for um, um, observing the deformations occurring in this model, okay? Um, so this would be the, ba the basic uh, mesh surface. I'm going to take a mesh component and, uh, and uh, set wire display to hidden. So I will be using this for all the um, further implementation of the uh, textile model. And I'm going to leave this uh, visible. So for example, what we want to do, we want to um, convert this into a textile or a fabric model. So first of all, elastic force, always, okay? Um, and uh, in this case, we are going to apply a mesh goal and we are going to convert this into a, an elastic net using the edge lengths, uh, like this. And it's important to, to notice that um, while length line, which works on, on single, uh, springs, the, the edge length works on the whole mesh, so each edge will be converted into a spring, okay? And uh, um, the difference between the length line and edge length is that while length line works with length, edge lengths work with length factor, okay? So if I want uh, this textile to be stretchy, okay, then eventually I would use a length factor between zero and one, okay? And if I want this uh, textile uh, to be capable of extending, okay, and then I will use a uh, length factor up to, normally I set this value up to two, 
so each spring uh, each age can grow longer twice its actual size okay so for the moment i will set this slider to one so what i'm saying is that this textile doesn't want to to uh contract and doesn't want to to uh, expand okay in this moment and strength is set by default to one so just a quick um notice i will not go uh into um this uh, uh this aspect uh, today but um many many people believe that um that uh, physical simulation with kangaroo is not realistic but it's not like that uh you can give strength the the specific value for any material that you want to consider in your simulation the only problem that you have in that case is that the simulation becomes very very slow okay so each deformation occurring in the system in real time is not in real time it can it can take uh several seconds to calculate each step of the deformation okay so the, the simulation itself might be during like hours okay so it's not that it's not possible it's just that it, it is not convenient to do it okay normally so just let's continue let's consider that each um time you see a kangaroo deformation in your in your object it's we can say it's proportional to the uh real deformation that would occur occur in your in your model okay so that's it for the uh, elastic properties we already have the uh, elastic mesh okay and as you can see uh it is not emitting uh, this component is not emitting one single goal so as i was saying it is converting each edge of our mesh into a spring okay so that's the the job of this uh, edge length and uh, eventually the the important things that we are that we need to define here is uh whether we want to um uh, keep this model fixed during simulation somewhere so at the anchor points uh in in some let's say strategic position and if we want this uh, object to interact for example with gravity or or some vertical load uh, uh dragging this object uh, downward or upward eventually who knows okay um so what i'm going to do right now i'm just going to um anchor this object at these four corners and uh, in this case um you see that in uh, in the mesh group you have this component here which is mesh corners and it gives you exactly the four vertices of this uh, mesh i invite you to understand how these uh, components work because it is not like just the four corners of this uh, uh, square mesh it works according to an angle so if you have complex meshes it is nice to see how the angle affects the creation of, of the anchor points okay um so in this case i have the four corners which are more than enough for me and i'm going to apply a gold point like anchor which will keep this four point fixed during the simulation okay so what i expect to see is some deformation occurring but these four vertices will stay in place okay um and also i will use my uh, mesh container in order to avoid like weird uh, wires uh, running through the definition okay um the other thing that I'm going to apply to this mesh is, um, well, let's say a vertical load for now. Uh, we could apply vertical load using the goals point load, but as we are dealing with a whole mesh, in goals mesh, you will find a vertex load, okay? So actually, if you want to apply a load to this mesh, you should isolate all the vertices of this mesh and then apply a load to each point uh, that you have uh, obtained okay so this is a component that do this automatically okay so it extracts the vertices and apply a vertical load to all the vertices the only limitation is that if you don't want a vertical load you cannot use the vertex loads okay so i will copy paste this and apply these vertical loads to our uh, initial mesh so this mesh is actually elastic is anchored to its vertices four vertices and it's basically subject to a vertical load with a strength of minus 0 0.1, okay? Which is more than enough for our simulation right now. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to grab a solver. I do prefer to initially to work with the bouncy solver. And I'm going to, first of all, prepare the bouncy solver, which means I don't plug the goals to the bouncy solver uh, initially. I prefer to use a toggle. Well, actually this is the, the, the thing um when you use a boolean toggle 
and you set the simulation to 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 pause, for example, um, and then you run the simulation and make your considerations and whatever. Okay, and then you just close Grasshopper file and you forget to switch the Boolean toggle to false once again. Okay, so in that case, the, the next time you open Grasshopper file with Kangaroo, Kangaroo will be running, and if your simulation is is let, let's say quite complex, uh, your computer might get stuck while a grasshopper and kangaroo perform the whole simulation of your model okay and if you try and if you have a very complex simulation and you try to uh, stop the simulation somehow grasshopper and rhino become the famous windows word uh, unstable okay so it means that if you click once again i will crash this is the meaning the technical meaning of, of being unstable okay so i do recommend that you or either uh, remember to switch the boolean toggle to false once again or use the uh, false start toggle, which is basically a, a plugin, okay? Where, where if you uh, switch this to true, and for example, copy paste it, the new copy will be set to false automatically, okay? And also if you close Grasshopper file and you forget to switch back the false start toggle to false, when you open the file once again, it will be already in its false status, okay? So I do recommend that you, uh, uh, use the false start toggle, especially when you work with, with uh, plugins like Kangaroo. Okay, and then I will add a button to reset the simulation. Okay, I do this before connecting the goals. Okay, because if you don't set the simulation to false before connecting the goals, when you connect a goal, uh, the solver will start calculating. Okay, so I prefer to set this to false, which is on by default. Okay, and then start connecting the uh, the goals not like this like this okay so one other thing that i do recommend always when you work with kangaroo is basically there is no need to see what happens on the left uh, side of your of your solver okay so just select everything and uh, turn the preview off okay and you can see that now we have this elastic net visible and we are ready to run the simulation so if i run the simulation i have this so the elastic net is falling down because of the let's say vertical load applied all over the mesh so as you can see it's minus zero one but it's very powerful because uh, well actually it's minus zero one applied to each of the vertices of your mesh so you must uh let's say think that this minus zero one is multiplying by the amount of vertices that you have here okay so that's why the effect is so relevant and also uh there is a, an elastic strength of one which is quite weak and also, uh, these uh, springs are already in their uh, rest length phase, which means basically uh, that eventually their elastic action tends to bring them back to the original length they had. Okay, but if we had some, if we add some pretension to our mesh, for example, if I say that the length factor is is less than one, then these springs will tend to contract okay contract badly in order to reach the zero length which is unreal okay but this is applying some pretension to our textile okay normally this is something you don't want to do okay when you work with a a textile like i don't know cotton or whatever you must leave this to one okay because by itself a a piece of of uh, of fabric like cotton doesn't want to expand or contract naturally, okay? It's just like in its rest length configuration, okay? So when you work with uh, with textile, normally the length factor is set, is, is you, you leave it to one, okay? Eventually you must adjust the strength, okay? So one is not the strength of cotton. So if you want, well, I had it published in my uh, old website, but I'm going to publish in, in, the new, in the new website today after the webinar. But I will share with you a Grasshopper script with uh, uh, the um, way of applying a real strength to um, to this uh, um, elastic functions in Kangaroo in order to have the right, the realistic, um, let's say, behavior of, of uh, uh, a real textile in Kangaroo. But remember that we will be talking about values which will range between 10,000 and hundreds of thousands, okay? So in that case, the simulation becomes very slow. And we can do it like here without um, referring to a particular material. But if I set this 
uh, let's say, strength to 100,000, and I plug like this, you see that the deformation is already running, but it becomes very small, especially the small deformation, they are very small, they, they are very slow, okay? Um, so you see that it becomes like, um, let's say, uh, it, it's, it's not convenient to work with these, uh, uh, with these uh, values, like in, in strength. Okay, so um, I repeat, you will have the definition uh, uploaded on my website uh, later on today. Um, so this is basically uh, a, a very, a very uh, simple approximation of uh, a textile. Okay, there are some things that we are not taking into account, which are very important. So first of all, let's try to uh, let's say add some um, let's say complexity to this model. So let's not refer only to the, um, let's say, square panels of our of our mesh. Okay, so let's introduce diagonals. And in order to introduce diagonals, I'm going to stop the simulation and also uh, turn off the preview of the bounces over. So I'm going to create uh, a different model. Okay, starting from this mesh that I already have, um, I'm going to create the, the diagonals. Well, actually, uh, as we already saw, we can take uh, advantage of the, um, uh, lunchbox uh, functions that we already discussed here. So let's say we want to create an asymmetrical structure for our model. So I'm going to use the 1D structure. Okay, so copy paste it and turn it off on and then apply it to our, sorry, initial surface. Okay, so this will give us this kind of representation. And of course, if we want uh, the set of springs to correspond to our mesh, we must also apply the same amount of division to our model, okay? So we will have uh, 20 by 20 uh, panels, okay? Each one with its primary lines and brace lines. Now, um, we are going to use these lines as springs, and not only, as we saw, uh, not only the springs coming from the uh, edges of each panel like this. We also need to consider the diagonals in this case. So uh, there is a, a few consideration, considerations that we must, uh, uh, let's say, do right now. We have eight, four, zero uh, primary lines, which remember they are the um, the uh, edges of each panel. Okay, so eight, four, zero, and here we have eight, four, zero. Okay, so this is important because uh, if you don't work with one D structure, for example. And you work with a standard uh, paneling technique like isotreme, for example, which is another way of paneling a, a, a surface, then uh, you will have, as a result, you will have a panel here. And then you will have another panel here. Just imagine that these two lines are coincident, of course. Um, and then you will have other panels and other panels and so on. Okay. But if you uh, get to this point using, like, for example, isotreme, Okay, and you obtain this. The isotheme will give you one panel, like two and three and four. Then you must extract its edges. And then you have four edges for this, four edges for this, and four edges for this, and four edges for this. So it means that here you will have one and two overlapping edges. And here you have two overlapping edges. And here as well, and here as well. The only edges that appear only once are the surrounding edges for our surface. So in that case, you should get rid of duplicate lines, okay? But in, the, in this case, we are seeing that the amount of lines, 840, corresponds exactly to the amount of lines of this automatic edge length. So this means that the braced grid 1D structure is um, wisely emitting only one of the two edges that are, for example, here, okay? So this is very important because if you don't do this, if you don't take into account this particular situation, you might have double the, the effect of a spring corresponding to the inner edges and uh, one single application of the spring uh, tension along the edge of your uh, textile uh, model, okay? Um, so in this case, we can see that everything is working just fine. And on the other hand, we have this, which would be 400 and yes, it is, 400 diagonals, one per each uh, panel, okay? So um, let's apply some, um, 
elastic behavior to these lines, actually, not to, to the mesh. Okay, so I'm just going to, uh, let's say, use one single line container. Okay, you can see, by the way, sometimes it's important to understand how the, uh, these values are sorted inside the, this, uh, uh, this container here. You see that I still see line, 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 line. So it means that even if I'm blending two lists together, I'm not getting um, a, a data tree. Okay, but anyway, this is in, in this moment it's not that relevant because Kangaroo Two works um, seamlessly with data trees or lists. Okay, so there is no um, problem if you get a data tree here. So I get one single set of, of lines, and I'm going to convert the, these lines into uh, springs. I'm not going to use the edge lengths right now because I have both edges and diagonals, and diagonals uh, are not part of the edges set of, of a mesh okay so i am forced to use the length line length line is the more accurate way of simulating a textile or a fabric in in kangaroo okay so just keep in mind that even if there is this automatic way of converting a mesh into an a, elastic net don't do that unless you want a, a simplified model of the textile or you want a symmetrical behavior or your of your textile but it's very difficult to program the textile if you use an automatic component like edge length. Okay, so I prefer to work with length line in this uh, in this case, and I'm going to convert these lines, each of these lines, into springs. Okay, and you see that we have 1,240 springs right now, which includes the 840 plus the 400 diagonals. Okay, and the length says that if you don't provide any value, I will consider that the actual length is the rest length which is perfect for us because we say that we don't want this textile to have any pretension. Okay, so let's leave this to, let's say, empty like this. Um, if you want to have a controlled behavior of your of your springs, of your textile, I do recommend that you um, uh, perform this little calculation, like calculate the length of the actual, actual segments and multiply them by a length factor which is actually the values that we were using for our uh, edge lengths in case of a mesh conversion into an elastic length. So basically what we are doing here are introducing the, um, the rest length, the, the length factor basically, uh, by multiplying the actual length uh, by a, a, a multiplication factor. So if I set this to zero, I am saying I want these lines to contract down to zero length, and if I set this to two, I want the lines during the simulation to reach double the extension of the actual configuration. Okay, um, so this is in case you want to to have some control over pretensioning of your of your textile. Okay, um, so here are the springs, and uh, I'm I'm not going to use uh, uh, this uh, mesh now for for creating the elastic behavior because I already did it here. I'm going to use it only for the rest of the simulation, the rest of the aspects of our simulation. So I will still need anchor points and I will still still need gravity, okay? So these two here depend on the mesh and are just perfect, okay? So let's switch back to our uh, previous uh, configuration. And what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to create a switch in my definition. Well, I call it a switch. Uh, you can call it whatever you want. Um, and, and also my student call it switch because they don't have any other reference. Um, so um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to decide whether I want to work with uh, um, springs coming from the um, edges plus diagonal or springs coming from just the edges of our uh, mesh, okay? So I'm going to create here a generic data container like this, which can contain any type of, of, of values, okay? And I'm going to plug this instead of the edge lengths inside our goal object okay so basically here my switch will be this one so if i want to work with the edge length i will just plug this here and if i want to work with the edge length i will plug, uh, sorry with the length line i will plug this one here and i will substitute the one this uh, uh, behavior with just one wire so i don't have to disconnect anything and reconnect a different uh, wire okay so let's uh, stick to our um complex set of, uh, of edges and uh, I'm still using the four vertices as anchor point and I'm still using the vertex loads that I, that I already programmed okay and uh, 
I will going to turn off the preview of everything that's on the left and turn on the preview of, of Kangaroo. Okay, so let's reset. Very important when, when you work with Kangaroo, always reset before running the simulation. Okay, um, this is something that must be automatic. Don't think, oh, did I do something? Did I change the geometric system so I need to reset or not? Well, just reset. It's the click of a button. Okay, so don't waste time uh, thinking uh, about this and run the simulation. Okay, so the difference between this simulation and the previous one is that the text type is asymmetric. Okay, so you can see that it has some orientation. The deformation is oriented somehow, and somehow means especially in the direction of our diagonals. Okay, so having these diagonals affect the deformation of the deformability of our uh, system. Okay, so this that's why it's very important to refer to, um, let's say, physical model or, or, or geometrical model in this case for representing a fabric or, or, or a textile structure, okay? So in this case, for example, as we introduce an, uh, something uh, asymmetric in our model, you see that the deformation is, not, is no longer symmetric. And it's very interesting because we also have, um, let's say, the possibility to make some kind of, uh, of uh, programming for our textile. So, for example, uh, let's say I stop the simulation and, and reset it, okay? Uh, so, what I'm going to do right now is this. I'm going to make this a little more complex. Uh, well, complex is, is too much. Um, complicated, okay? So, I, I, I'm, introducing, I'm, I'm introducing some complication, okay? Which is not necessarily complexity. Uh, so, what I'm going to do, I'm going to move everything here a little lower. And I'm going to separate the property of the natural edges of my mesh, which are the little square, from the properties of the diagonals, okay? So, like, consider we are using two different uh, materials for the threads. So, the edges have one material and the diagonals a different one, okay? Which is something that you can do uh, when you work with industrial uh, knitting machine, for example. You can uh, set uh, the different threads to use a different type of, uh, of material, okay? And then you can program the behavior of a textile. So that's that's the trick, okay? So what I'm going to do, instead of, of using one single line container in order to work with both type of edges or diagonals, I'm going to split this into two different um, workflow like this. And I'm going to use the first one for the uh, uh, surrounding the natural edges of the mesh and the second one for the diagonals okay so you see diagonals are here and what i want to do i want these diagonals to be pre-tensioned okay so i want them to tend to zero like very very uh, dramatic action okay and then what i want to do i want to implement a different switch in this case because i need a first layer where i want to work with both um, uh, let's say uh, types of uh, threads and then I want to create a the real switch, which is between the actual uh, edges plus diagonals and the uh, only the mesh edges. Okay, so I am uh, creating a switch like here, and then I prefer normally to do this uh, with uh, uh, this configuration. Okay, so this is actually my switch, and normally my switches are like fifty, like this. So yellow for me means that I, I have to make a decision in the inside this uh, uh, this group, and the decision is whether I want to work with one or another set of uh, edges. Okay, and then I'm going just once to disconnect this and plug the other uh, wire. So now I have two different behaviors for the mesh edges, which which are this one, and the diagonals, which are these ones. So if I reset and run the simulation. You see that now I get a totally different behavior. Okay, so the fact that these uh, diagonals can can contract down to zero is deforming this object very much. Okay, so what's the problem here? The problem is that we have diagonals that tend to zero, and the only thing that can uh, uh, put a stop to this uh, uh, dramatic deformation should be the mesh edges. Okay, like this one. But these ones are very weak because they have a strength of 10 as the strength of the diagonals, okay? So the thing that we can do right now is start increasing the strength of, for example, 
these uh, uh, these little squares okay or reduce the intensity of this contraction okay so you can see that you can program this uh, this textile i'm not going to i repeat i'm not going to use um strengths for now just keep in mind that when this uh, textile this fabric has some uh offers some resistance in the diagonal direction then you have this kind of tension especially where the diagonal act uh, in a uh, in a relevant way which is basically along the main diagonal of our initial surface okay so as you can see we are creating some kind of ripples on the textile so you see that this textile is just raises here then falls and raises and fall once again which is something very natural when you uh let's say extend let's say a a any type of textile you should have this kind of behavior unless the textile is totally symmetrical in in its uh thread and it's in its knitting okay um so this is very important because uh differentiating the edges that you want to um uh, uh, let's say affect with some elastic behavior from uh, different sets it's the key for programming uh, textile of course now i'm using an automatic component like the uh, grid one 1d structure which separates the uh, mesh edges from the diagonals but i could also uh, separate whole areas of the textile from different areas and and uh, let's say program that area with a um, a specific uh, elastic behavior okay so i can differentiate the elastic behavior of each part of a textile model okay so that's the the, the interesting thing uh one quick uh very quick observation um well actually the bounces over says converged so it is no longer calculating i can set this uh, toggle to false and this is the final uh textile that i am getting i do recommend that when you have the um uh, simulation uh, already uh, paused or, or done you take the output like with, uh, we, we want to see the textile basically. I don't care about, you see that the, the solver only uh, shows lines and, and vertices, okay? But normally we want to see the mesh, okay? Uh, so in order to see the mesh, uh, we must tell Kangaroo to uh, visualize the mesh during the simulation. And this is done by using the show component. And I'm going to uh, use a copy of this in order to have the mesh shown during the simulation so you see that now we have uh, a a uh, three-dimensional aspect or a, a solid aspect for our um, mesh which is represented in a shaded uh, mode so what i'm going to do i'm going to take this mesh and isolate it this is something i call cleaning the the output okay and cleaning the output is important because if you don't clean the output some function uh uh, could um, run into problems or just don't emit any any result for example what i want to do is create a smoother aspect for this mesh okay which is important when you display a textile deformation um so here we have uh, the mesh uh, but the problem is that kangaroo normally uh, outputs a whole set of of, of things um, especially it contains several null uh, values okay so we want to get rid basically of these null values. Um, but also we can see that in this case, we have a mesh and we have lines, okay? So I only want to work with the mesh. So that's why I take a mesh container. Uh, a mesh container is something that only understands mesh. So if you uh, tell uh, this mesh container line, it will convert also the lines into null objects. So for example, let me recover this, uh, this panel here. You see that we have lines up to 1685 uh, index. If I take the mesh component and just copy paste this panel and take a look at the, 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 the values contained, you see that all these values here at the bottom of the panel has been converted, have been converted into null object as well. Okay. So the reason why I use this mesh container is to get rid of uh, all the geometric uh, values that we don't need. So I prefer to convert anything into nulls and then clean uh, the tree. Well, actually, this is not a tree. This is a list, but a list can be seen as a uh, tree with uh, one single branch, okay? So here, as a result, we only have our mesh, okay? The final mesh. So this is the clean value that we can use, for example, to, uh, let's say, smoothen using, let's say, a couple of cracks subdivision. 
And you see that now we have a more uh, uh, a smoother aspect for our uh, textile. So the vertices tend to smooth, and you have this kind of nice reflections occurring on over the, the surface. And you see the wrinkles that we have been creating. Okay, uh, you can also increase the amount of subdivision. It depends on the uh, computing power that you have in your uh, machine, but. Um, you see that this is is uh, creating a, a very nice uh, um, aspect for our mesh, especially if we get rid of the edges visualization, like Control M. You have this kind of uh, of behavior here, of, of nice behavior. Um, you could also use another um, smoothing algorithm, like the the loop. Uh, let me do this. But you see that in this case, as the loop. Uh, is a triangular um, um, subdivision algorithm, then you will have, uh, let's say, a specific direction for the polygons in your mesh. So you see how the smoothing is completely different between the two. Okay, so I do recommend eventually that you use in this um, smoothing phase, you use the Cutmore Clark because you have a symmetrical uh, subdivision of your, of your polygons. Okay. Um, and eventually, you see that the smoothing is also affecting the edges, the corner, sorry. So you, you might want to switch to corner fixed, like here, say, corner fixed. So you have exactly the corners uh, preserved during this uh, smoothing occurring, OK? Um, now, the, the thing is that we are increasing the resolution right now of, your, of, of the mesh, OK? Uh, I prefer to do this after kangaroo simulation and not increasing the amount of subdivisions for our initial uh, mesh. Because if you have, for example, in this case, uh, we are working with a mesh with 25,600 uh, polygons, OK? So imagine if you tell Kangaroo, please calculate the deformation of a system with two, well, actually 26,000 polygons, then in that case, Kangaroo, well, it's it, it can become very, very hard for, for Kangaroo to calculate each step of the simulation, OK? So I do recommend that you keep the simulation, uh, let's say, light, so it can run smooth, and then you perform some kind of smoothing operation, OK? Especially when you want, when you want a um, smooth uh, representation of your textiles, OK? And you, want, you don't want this, um, let's say, faceted uh, representation, OK? So, um, this is already, um, let's say, uh, producing some kind of, uh, of interesting result. Of course, we can uh, bake and uh, see the high resolution aspect of our of our mesh. There is a little bit of orientation because, uh, it, well, actually, uh, when, when I say orientation, I refer to this change uh, in, in, in the brightness of the surface, which depends on the fact that we have uh, deformed a, um, a, a quad mesh with some uh, triangular structure, because remember that we are using also the diagonals, OK? And then now we are switching back to a quad uh, representation of the mesh. So uh, this, that's why you get this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, brightness variation, especially visible in, along the diagonal. But uh, this is something that eventually you could work with other smoothing algorithms. Uh, this one that I'm using is from Weaverbird. But there are also many other plugins, like, for example, uh, yeah, the mesh plus and and so on that you might want to uh, give it a try and and uh, and see how they work and if you get a uh, smoother result. Okay, but this is just this is just aesthetic. Okay, the important thing is this one. Okay, the clean mesh that we are getting, which is basically uh, this one. So here we have the two results: our low resolution version and the high resolution version, but they represent the same deformation. Okay. Um, so yeah, we can reset the simulation uh, right now. And then uh, let me quickly uh, switch back to uh, the webinar. Uh, let me see if uh, you have some uh, uh, Sonia. So um, I will not give you, uh, uh, let's say, um, so I just joined me to be part of the webinar. Will the webinar? Yeah, Sonia, it will be recorded. Yeah, OK, if it, if this was the question, OK. Um, the flash, the false start toggle, it's it's a plug. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, okay. I, I see you're pretty uh, well by yourself. <laughs> you're, you're answering your, your own question. Um, Alexander, I, I, I told you, uh, mm, well, let, let's see what happens. Um, 
I'm, I am accepting. Uh, Alexander, you should get a message where you could uh, start your your um, uh, bro broadcasting right now. I don't know if it's working. But anyway, I, I do prefer to keep the uh, questions for, for the Q&A session, which, by the way, will happen in, in half an hour. Uh, so if, if it's nothing uh, urgent or, or relevant or, or has to deal with plugins or, or connection, I see that everything is working just fine. So just save your questions for uh, the... Can you explain once how the length factor plays an important role in this simulation? Uh, well, actually, um, I, 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 told, I told you that uh, length factor means adding some pretension. Pre Tension. Okay, so you're you're saying that um, during the simulation or in in the start, in, in the moment the simulation starts, the material is already subject to some elastic tension. Okay, now this is something that you don't use in textile simulation. Okay, that, that's why I told that um, this uh, this value here normally should be set to one. Okay, because when you have a let's say a cotton fabric uh, and you leave the cotton let's say by itself lying on a couch or, or, or whatever, okay? Then you, you see the cotton is not moving, okay? It, it stands still because by itself, it doesn't want to contract or expand, okay? So this is the meaning of the length factor. Now, I was just differentiating the behavior of, behavior of the diagonal in order to have some kind of control or program deformation. But I, I told as well that this is something that you might want to do with the strength, like using different materials or, or different type of threads, okay? But as I don't want to work with strengths, I'm just pre-tensioning the diagonals in this case. But I do recommend that you don't do this with textile simulation, okay? Just leave everything to rest length to one in with textile simulation, okay? Rest length less than one is something that you use, for example, in, in architectural design, okay? Uh, when you want to work with pre-tensioned concrete, for example, okay? Or pre-stressed and so on. So you give um, the, the architectural elements some, some pretension in order for these elements to be able to bear some uh, higher loads, okay? But not in this case, because textile normally are soft bodies, okay? So there is no need to add pretensioning to a textile, a textile, sorry. Um, so uh, unless you are in a, in a physics lab and you are uh, very well aware of what's the contribution of a pre-tensioned diagonal uh, inside this regular grid. But this is something very, very, very specific. Okay, you, you, you don't want to do this normally. Um, okay, uh, so what's next? Because this, this is something that, okay, so we already have our textile, which is this one, and, and we're done. No, we're not done, okay? So let's see what happens if we, if we um, add some other uh, complication to this model, okay? So let's say, for example, that I want this object to be um, anchored to these points here, okay? Only the, the upper points. So I have uh, my mesh here. I'm going to uh, turn off uh, the uh, clean output preview. I have this mesh here, and I want to isolate all these vertices because I want to use them as anchor points. Okay, um, so as there is the mesh corners, which basically detects the vertices of uh, the corners, actually not the vertices, the corners of a mesh, whatever it means, and you must play with angle if you want to understand what it means. Uh, there is also another component which is called um, um, naked vertices. Okay, so naked vertices in this case is it's uh, uh, very useful. Uh, of course, there is also the uh, the mesh, the construct mesh component that gives you access to the whole set of vertices of your mesh, okay? But I prefer to work with naked vertices in this case because naked vertices is um, dividing the clothed points from the naked points. So the naked points are the points that lie along the edges, the naked edges of the mesh. And as I want to isolate these vertices here, I don't want to de with, deal with clothed points which are in the inner part of the mesh, okay? So I use the naked points as a starting uh, value, okay? I also uh, use a uh, wireless mesh container in order to don't have, uh, let's say, disturbing cables running through the definition. So uh, here are the naked vertices. I want to isolate only these ones here. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to deconstruct these points, okay? 
and I'm going to consider only those points which have the highest y component. Okay, so I'm going to uh, use well, actually, I'm going to use a plugin. Okay, because it's uh, quite uh, fast, or uh, else you should um, uh, find the highest values between this one. I'm going to use a min max. Uh, the min max comes from Heteroptera once again. Heteroptera has a whole bunch of uh, of interesting uh, components. I'm going to uh, make here, write down here a quick note so you know uh, Heteroptera, so you know where this uh, uh, component comes from. But Rhino 6 uh, actually um, tells you when you try opening a file which uses um, plugins, uh, asks you to install dynamically the plugins that it's missing. So uh, there is no need for this. But in any case, you have it like here. So Y component, I plug it this into, into number. And I get maximum like 10. So I already have the value. OK? Um, so if you don't have this, you should, uh, just so that you know, you should construct the main like, uh, sorry, you should take the uh, uh, bounds component so you know what's the range of your value, which would be minus 10 to 10. And then you could uh, uh, deconstruct the domain and then you finally have the end value here. Okay. So in this case, I you only use the min max uh, component. So I have the maximum already. And then I'm going to evaluate whether the Y component is equal to the maximum here. Now, I, I do recommend, in this case, for example, this is something uh, uh, like real life uh, tricks. Uh, of course, you have equality, OK? Um, but when you work with uh, with simple meshes like this, there is no problem if you use equality. Well, all, well actually, yes, there is uh, uh, the same problem. but. Uh, eventually, we are working with, with integer numbers, OK? So it's very easy that if I do this and I do this, I should get some uh, true answers. Let's double check. Yes, you see we have trues here, OK? But when you work with, uh, with decimal numbers or some irregular shapes, this equality uh, is very likely that, that it doesn't give you any positive result, OK? So I recommend that you use a similarity instead. So you compare, in this case, the Y component with the maximum value because it uses a, a, a threshold. And this threshold is uh, set uh, in percentage. So you see that it ranges from 0% to 100%. So you can be as precise as you want, OK? So uh, this is calculating, uh, well, it, it, it's actually um, um, stating if these two values are equal with a tolerance of 0.1%. OK, so it's a very fine tolerance. OK, uh, but I can use a slider between 0 0.01 up to 100, plug it here and set it to 0, 01, which was the default value. OK, so uh, let's see what happens here when I try to uh, get rid of the falses that I get. So if I call pattern, I want to call what? Well, the naked vertices. OK, so I want to call the naked vertices using the similarity pattern that I get from here. And you see that I get only the points that lie on this edge, which are the ones that I am looking for. OK, and also if I increase the tolerance, if I say look for similar uh, coordinates, Y coordinates, but with more tolerance, you see that eventually it starts to find also naked points which are far from the edge. OK, if I say 100, well, it gets to half the uh size of our mesh okay so uh i do recommend that you work with similarity in this case so these are the points that i want to use as anchor points um we already have them so i'm going to um, move everything like here a little more uh, to the right and i'm going to use these as the uh, anchor points but i don't want to use them as uh, standard anchor points because during the simulation, what I want to do, I want this textile to, um, let's say, raise in along this edge. So I want this edge to move up during the simulation. OK, uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the uh, points that I that I have just found and I'm going to move them. Up to a certain height, like let, let's say this surface has a length of uh, 20, actually. Uh, because it's minus 10 to 10. 
So I'm going to move this more or less up to 20. Okay, so I'm going to use this slider here. Uh, sorry, with a Z, unit Z vector. Okay, so like this. And I can decide how high I want this uh, edge to reach during the simulation. Okay, so this will be actually uh, the uh, anchor point during the simulation. And if you want to, um, if you want to do this, uh, if you want to have these anchor points during the simulation, you cannot use just the anchor as is. You must tell Grasshopper, you must tell Kangaroo that the anchor points that you are considering are actually the ones that we have selected from our call pattern, okay? And we want them during the simulation to uh, move to this target point, okay? So during the simulation, the position of the anchor points will depend basically on this slider. Okay, so I will be able to increase or decrease the height of this edge during the simulation. Okay, and I want to get rid of the previous anchor points. Okay, so what I want to do right now is add another switch like this. I'm going to move uh, all the rest of uh, the uh, goals like up. So I will have these things here, and I'm going to create another switch between these anchor points and which which were the corners okay so i need a data uh and i need another data and i need uh another data here so i want to work with the new ones so i will get rid of this and i will use this data container here so this is going to be the kangaroo simulation and here we have another switch like color and 50, which is the yellow, and then alpha to 255. Okay, so everything is uh, uh, preview off, and we have these two options here, one for the uh, um, elastic property and one for the anchor point. Okay, so actually I will be using the H-like anchor point. So let's see what happens if I run this simulation with a low resolution representation. Let's get rid of the mesh preview, and uh, everything set to preview off on the left, as always. So reset and run. So you see that now this is instantly uh, dragged upward, okay? So it starts to hang because of, of, of the action of gravity. So vertex loads is still acting, okay? And you see that now we have this kind of, of uh, textile hanging from one edge. And we can, during the simulation in real time, we can use the, the uh, anchor target point like this in order to decrease or increase the height of this edge. Now, what's the problem if we do this? The problem is that this textile is not behaving like a real textile because it is uh, basically self-colliding or self-intersecting. Uh, so this is something that um, it is not uh, entirely possible in real life. Well, I would say it's totally impossible. So we must get rid of this uh, phenomenon, okay? Um, so uh, what we need to do is avoid uh, technically, uh, what happens here is that if you have a mesh like this, okay, uh, what we must avoid is that this vertex here can pass through this polygon. This is what happens when you have these, this kind of self-intersection, okay? So uh, auto-intersection occurs when the vertices can move freely uh, in the space without considering the presence of meshes polygons. Okay, so we don't want this to happen. And the way uh, we can avoid this is that if we consider the same structure for our mesh, and if we consider the vertices, one way, one easy way of uh, avoiding this self-intersection is basically avoiding that this vertex here can pass between these two vertices, okay? So this is what we are going to do. And in order to do this, what we are going to do is basically uh, simulate the presence of spheres around these vertices. So if this is a sphere, and this sphere tries to pass between these two, it can't because we are creating a collision between all these little spheres, okay? Actually, the component that we are going to use, it's in goals collision, and this is called sphere collide. That's why it's called sphere collide, okay? So it asks for points, and it asks what's the radius of the spheres that you want to use, okay? 
So the points that we are going to use are all the points of the mesh, but the anchor points. So sphere collision, sp uh, sphere collision, yes, has some problem with anchor points. Okay. So if you try to to apply sphere collide to anchor points, uh, basically what happens during the simulation is that it simply crashes. Okay. It it, it doesn't work properly. Okay. If you're lucky, uh, you you just have no uh, output preview. If you are not lucky, it can it, it can also hang your your grasshopper. Okay, so sphere collide asks for all the points that are not anchor points. Okay, so our points that are anchor points are these. Okay, this edge, and I want the remaining points to be uh, affected by the sphere collide. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to well, in order to to keep things clear, I'm not going to use previous. Uh, parts of the script, I'm going to start brand new, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take another, um, uh, well, sorry, no, in this case, yeah, I'm going to use uh, the uh, the mesh, the construct mesh, because I want all the vertices, and I want to get rid of this line of points here, okay? So in order to do this, you can use a vector uh, point, and it is called, uh, what was the name? Call duplicates. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell call duplicates that I'm going to give him a whole bunch of points, which are all the vertices from our mesh, plus the points that are anchor points, like this. Now I am plugging two lists here. Okay. And uh, this list has zero, zero has a name. And this one as zero, zero as a name. So when I go here, here, you see that I still see the values, okay? So it means that I have a, a simple list of values because you see that this uh, points input asks for points as list. So in order for these call duplicates to work properly, you might always want to flatten the input, okay? Always. And we don't want the average because you see that the average is not giving us the desired result. I want to call all the duplicates so you see that when i do this here we miss a line of points which are exactly the line of points consisting of the anchor points okay so these points i want them to be affected by the sphere collide and the sphere collide is going to have a radius of well let's keep this like from totally uncontrolled like zero to uh, extremely uh, unlikely to work like five, okay? And initially I will set this to one, which is the default value, by the way. So here we have our new goal, which is sphere collide. Let me get rid of the preview of the anchor points. And I want to also connect this to the goals. And you see that just the mesh already is, is already doing something. Now it's very, um, let's say, uh, it's not difficult, but it, 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 it's very, you, you must, uh, concentrate on one aspect okay so if i set this value to zero you see that the sides of this mesh is especially in this area here just fall down smoothly okay but if i start to increase this you see that this object here is starting to stretch horizontally especially but also vertically okay but here is starting to inflating horizontally okay this is the effect of these spheres that are basically colliding with each other okay so this is actually something that avoids uh, that our textile can self-intersect. So if I start to move this edge down or up and down once again, you will notice that this object is not actually self-intersecting, okay? So this is very important when you uh, uh, do some kind of uh, textile simulation, okay? Um, so yeah, basically uh, we have our textile, which is actually uh, not um, uh, self-intersecting, which is a physical property that's basic, basically fundamental for any textile simulation. And what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to, um, well, actually, um, I think, I think uh, it's uh, um, pretty much for today. I'm going to use the next 20 minutes. So if you uh, want to discuss something or you have questions, we will have the second session happening next Saturday in order to, to implement the remaining uh, part of this textile simulation. 
Uh, so yeah, let's let's stop here for today, and let's open the the Q and A session. I just will stop this simulation, reset it so it lies on the floor, and I'm going to uh, also save this file because I will share it with you um, in the in this uh, file sharing that we have in our webinar. So let's me let's go back to our uh, webinar uh, window. So do you have any questions you want to, I find, call all, you find it or you cannot find it? Milena. Hmm? Well, well, the call all is basically this thing. It's, it's not called call all, it's call duplicates. And you have to switch to call all option because else it says average, okay, by default. And you want to eliminate all the duplicated points in this case. So that's why right click and call all. Uh, yes. Um, okay, Milena. Uh, yes, Giovanni, there is a way um, to do this kind of simulation. These are uh, somehow more advanced. We are not going to uh, to deal with this today, but yes, there is. Uh, two questions. Uh, first one regarding the installation of plugin I mentioned above. Okay, look, if if you um, if you have problem with uh, plugin installation, you can refer, for example, to uh, where is it here? Okay. But well, actually, I have two posts in my in my web page. One is Grasshopper plugins. Uh, I will. Um, Copy this link in, in this chat. Um, this is interesting because here you will find uh, the um, uh, a, a, a list of plugins divided by category and applications and industry and so on, which I believe are fundamentals. Okay, And the other one is plugin install. Uh, here we'll find a step-by-step -step guide on how uh, to install plugins in, in, in the proper way in Grasshopper. Um, okay, and the other one, let's think of fabric with rigid cables, not spring-like elastics. Okay. You're welcome, Ibrahim. So what with this fabric, uh, such as in fashion design, drapery comes with the orientation of, of course, yeah. Um, okay, Luis Eduardo. Um, permítame un segundo, ¿sí? Um, such is actually that drapery comes with the orientation of fabric. Of course, this is what we were uh, we were saying. Uh, actually, uh, when you uh, work with Kangaroo, let, let me show you uh, a few images that you might want to, you might find, uh, in, you might find it interesting, but for example, these are textile simulation um, so you will see a, a bunch of, of pictures here with different uh, behaviors. So this is like a, a curtain. Uh, these are textiles. These are programmed textiles. Okay, so you can see that you can program anything like um, differentiated behavior, elastic behavior, like stitching. Uh, you know, you, you can program almost everything as you can see here. So um, there are also like uh, well, this blanket which is quite simple. Um, but uh, this is a mattress. Uh, yeah, these. Okay, so you can see that, for example, you see that um, in this case, all of this variation here or this stripping is uh, because of uh, of programming of different uh, threads inside this mesh. The mesh is, is absolutely the same. So by changing the uh, orientation or or uh, physical properties of each fiber of this. Uh, Textile, you can get this, or, and you already know this. You can get this particular behavior. So of course you can you can do this kind of uh, of simulation, but uh, you have to spend a little time in programming the different uh, part of your of your model. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the feedback. Uh, how to apply the simulation architecture design accurately? Oh yeah. Uh, Architectural design, uh, it's something that uh, uh, has nothing to do with this textile simulation, unless you want to create some kind of soft bodies like, uh, I don't know, 
pillows or mattresses or curtains or I don't know towels and so on. Um, but uh, in terms of, of architectural design, if you want, I do recommend that you take advantage of the offer that's here for the Kangaroo Online course, uh, because here we will discuss basically, uh, well, actually all the applications that are relevant for architectural design, which are rigid bodies, tensegrity, origami, and so on. Okay, so I do recommend that you take advantage of this uh, of this offer, okay, which is which is limited. Um, forms come out for moving between nodes. Yeah, of course. Uh, in the end, in the end, you work on the on the springs, uh, but what you are you are affecting is the whole mesh, including the vertices, so the nodes, of course. Like on trusses and white spaces and design generally. Yeah, basically, for example, Manuel, just so that you have a manual, so that you have an idea. But uh, this, uh, I'm going to show you uh, this thing here. Um, so, like 2018, uh, IASS, MIT, Boston, and uh, you have this uh, model here, which is the work that I've done for the dome of the Sport Palace. Um, let's see if I have some pictures here or if I have them in the com section. Let me double check. Yeah, here they are, for example. Uh, you see, um, you see uh, this image here. Uh, this is actually the structure of the dome of the Sport Palace in, in Mexico City, uh, where uh, everything was simulated with, with kangaroo because the architect, Felix Candela, what he, what is, he, he left a, a, a little note uh, in one of, of his uh, original um, uh, project uh, documents uh, saying that the, the same dome uh, could be, um, let's say, uh, built with, uh, with a tensegrity structure, okay? So I simulated the tensegrity structure for this dome with kangaroo and calculated it with, um, with uh, Caramba 3D. Well, actually, it was my colleague, uh, Edwin Gonzalez, uh, which calculated, uh, performed the calculation with kangaroo. We split the work uh, into uh, between the two of us, uh, but yes, you can apply kangaroo to the simulation of uh, white system, like eventually the whole uh, dome of the sport palace, like this. Um, exactly, Leonardo. Exactly what we were doing here. Uh, does three D printing on fabric use such deformation techniques to obtain? You can do this also with the three D printing on fabric. Uh, because actually, if you think about it, the, 3D, the, the, the part of the fabric where you 3D print, uh, basically we have will have some some um, let's say a restriction uh, for the for extending or contracting. So basically, where uh, the parts that are 3D printed cannot contract uh, or uh, extend. So you are saying basically that in that part, uh, rest length is set to one. And the strength of the material is virtually infinite. Okay, so there is no deformation. Uh, did you try to export to Sub D new tool for manual revision? Not yet. Not yet. I I am working with Rhino Seven, uh, not for the Sub D. Uh, personally, uh, personally, I don't like this uh, old Sub D um, thing. I I didn't like all, either the uh, T splines where where the, when there was T spline. When I did when I need. Uh, uh, polygonal modeling. I prefer to work with Blender. Okay, so I, I don't work with meshes in uh, in Rhino normally, and uh, not even with Sub D and Rhino Seven. I'm using Rhino Seven for the interoperability interoperability with with uh, uh, Revit architecture. Uh, can you simulate to to twill weave plane weave so on? Um, what are you talking about, Milena? Sounds interesting. Can you give me an example or point me to an image or something? Uh, in the meanwhile, I, I move on. Uh, there is an area that talked about interaction between soft bodies, which is about flex. Um, flex software is this, uh, well, I don't know if there is any webinar. Um, it's, uh, it's quite complex. Uh, this kind of calculation, soft body to soft body collision is quite complex because you have a deforming body colliding with a deforming body. So everything happens in real time. The best tool that I know that can perform this kind of calculation um, is actually Houdini. Okay, so if you want to uh, further uh, investigate these kind of things, you might take a look at Houdini uh, textile simulation that can run simulation in real time with soft body to soft body collision collision up to hundreds of soft bodies. So it's quite effective. Okay, 
And Flex Software is, uh, it, it was, I, I don't know if they're still developing Flex Software. I have it installed actually in my Grasshopper interface. I don't know if you could see it, but um, uh, I think Kangaroo is actually a step ahead of Flex Software. But I think Flex Software is very promising because you know it, it works with uh, uh, with CUDA drives uh, drivers and it works with your graphic cards, so it's quite um, uh, effective when it, when when it comes to the simulation. So I myself have, have been trying uh, to work with Flex Software, but when any very specific things, I still need uh, Kangaroo. Uh, when is something regular result the type start so we can push the connect button? Uh, yeah, of course. This everything is is recorded. So, so yes, of course. I will. Uh, I, I don't know what what start are you talking about? Uh, push the reconnect button. Uh, I, I don't know. I think the reconnect the reconnect button is uh, actually um, always av available, as far as I know. But I will I will uh, take a look at it uh, later. Um, uh, Thank you, Leonardo, for suggesting my YouTube channel. Which real-life units does Kangaroo manage itself? Well, nothing by itself. But I will share on my web page later on today uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, definition, grasshopper definition, to use real material strengths in Kangaroo. Okay? But I told you, this is something that makes the definition very slow. So use it wisely. Okay? You're welcome. Could you repost the address of your homepage to see all, all your content? Yeah, sure. Um, Okay, my website, it's, it's very simple. It's, it's junkadm.com. And if you go here on, on junkadm.com, you will have here on top all the links to my, to my pages. So you will have Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Behance, and uh, Instagram, YouTube, and also uh, WhatsApp if you want to shoot me a message. Okay, so everything is here. Okay, so instead of sharing a bunch of, of links, just refer to my uh, web page. Okay, so this is, okay, let me double check. Uh, yeah, okay, so we are talking about very specific um, physical models, okay? Mm, you can do this. You can do this, uh, Milena. Actually, um, the examples that I just showed, like, like, uh, yeah, these ones here, well, well, not these ones because they are simply plain uh, representation of meshes, but more like this. If you take a look at these images here, we are talking about the way that threads intersect uh, in in the in the textile uh, structure. Okay, so this is what makes possible this kind of deformation. So yes, you can do it. The problem in that case is uh, um, is actually uh, we have been working with a very simple. Um, uh, let's say subdivision of the threads, like primary lines and brace lines using a, an automatic lunchbox component. But I told you that you can create whatever type of knitting you want inside your mesh. Of course, you have to to work with the prop with the appropriate set of uh, vertices and edges if you want to program this kind of co complex behavior. But yes, this is something that you you might. Uh, want to do definitely when it comes to complex um, models. But there are, uh, well, actually, there are many uh, researches going on on this. So uh, you, you could find many papers uh, online that deal with this kind of complex models. Okay. Um, thank you, Salvador. Nice that you have my book. There are people that are getting crazy with, with my books. But, but yeah, anyway, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm going to upload the webinar online. I think this way patterns can be done with Pufferfish. Uh, yeah, of course, but you know, Pufferfish is uh, it's it's very interesting. But it's it's like um, let's refer to two types of modeling, like static modeling and dynamic modeling. So what we are doing with Kangaroo is programming the deformation instead of of creating the deformed object. So there are several ways that you can um, uh, 3D model a deformed object like this. But uh, I, I, we are talking about dynamic deformations. Okay, so programming the behavior before it gets deformed. Okay. Okay, you're welcome, Milena. Uh, any other questions? Jose Ignacio, a ver si 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 tú puedes dar la palabra.
Any other questions? Do you have experience in modeling three-dimensional textiles? What do you mean by three-dimensional textiles? Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Pedro. Andrea, what do you mean by 3D, three-dimensional textiles? Which way to make nets of two levels with inner supports? Uh, yes, there is. <laughs> yes, there is. Uh, two levels, you mean two, two layers, right? Um, like two textiles, two, two layers of textiles with some interconnection going on between the two. But anyway, yes, there is. It's just uh, well, actually, if you if you want, you can also create a. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, Andrea. So it, it was the same question basically, uh, like like um, different layers. Uh, thank you, Ernesto. Different layers of. Oh, okay. Space fabrics. Let Let's double check this. Oh, okay. Like like this. Yeah, yeah. You can do this. You can do this. Um, and, and also, like always, you can program everything of this. The important thing is that you create the proper geometrical structure. Okay, once you have the structure, then you can keep any type of physical behavior to all the threads, both the threads for the um, the upper layer, the lower layer, and the interconnections here. Uh, the problem is creating the geometry. Okay, once you have the geometry, you can do whatever you want. Uh, yeah, I'm going to. Yeah, of course. Let me uh, save this uh, and I'm going to well not you uh, sorry I'm going to uh, share it like uh, here add a new file and it is going to be um, like this zero one because we will have a second session don't forget it uh, you should get a, 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 a notice by email. Uh, 3D models, no, this is training webinar and textile and uh, let's, let's do like this and share. Okay, here you have it. Um, yeah, well, well, one, one.